Okay. Well, thank you everyone for being here with us. Uh, as Molly mentioned, we will be walking you through some of the parts of the DDN product portfolio and the evolution of that portfolio. Um, we're going to try to explain why we do what we do. Uh, fundamentally, we're still very much an HPC company. Uh, that's our core. Uh, HPC continues to drive our long-term product roadmap. Um, what has been really, really interesting to watch over the last several years is the adoption by enterprise customers of HPC tools, which help them accelerate their workflows, be more competitive, and do things that they could not do before. Uh, and that has given us an opportunity to really broaden and expand our reach in the market uh, from government agencies and universities, which I think is the vast representation here is around those areas uh, into enterprise customers who are struggling with the same types of challenges that uh, we have been solving in this space for many, many years, but they are now starting to see the benefits of. Um, so at a very high level, you know, DDN, just very briefly, started in the late 90s, focused on uh, solving the, the I.O. challenges that large government agencies and academia were, were faced with. Um, um, did that for a number of years, uh, grew the company into uh, the largest private storage company in the world. We've been that for, for quite a few years. Uh, the company continues to grow very nicely, so double-digit growth, uh, profitable. Um, you know, we have the benefit of being independent as an organization, which gives us the ability to really respond to your needs uh, and the things that you ask us to do in, in a fairly efficient manner. We don't have to go and ask permission from, you know, investors and shareholders and all that. It's a very easy process to make decisions at DDN. Uh, we have roughly 600 people in about 20 countries, so fairly distributed uh, from an organizational standpoint. We go to market uh, directly as as well as through VARs, resellers, distributors, uh, and partners. Um, so as you know, we are providers of storage systems and solutions, uh, first and foremost, and so we attach to other things. And so as a result, we work very closely with systems companies and integrators. And, you know, we're in, in terms of where the company is headquartered, uh, we are in California, although uh, we are fairly distributed. These are some of the locations uh, where DDN has employees. Many of these locations are uh, technology centers. So technology centers, for instance, LA, Silicon Valley, Colorado, and Maryland, these are all engineering facilities where we do product development. Uh, we have a benchmarking center. Uh, oops. Benchmarking Center uh, in Dusseldorf for Europe. Uh, we set up an engineering facility in Paris, France, uh, which we are scaling very, very quickly. Uh, we started it about a year ago. Uh, lots of really bright engineers in that facility, and then a strong uh, technological presence in Japan uh, to serve the Asia-Pacific market. So that's kind of an overview of some of the DDN locations. Uh, in terms of the product portfolio, portfolio evolution. Um we started investing very heavily four or five years ago uh, into looking not just at uh, storage systems and the delivery of content and the processing of content with block and file, which historically is what DDN was doing, but we started looking at the end-to-end -end, uh, data management in organizations. End-to-end -end, uh, with really two primary thrusts. One of them was within a data center, how can we deliver deliver better efficiency um, and better performance through the applications which you are running in your data centers. Uh, so not just looking at performance optimization in storage, but kind of looking at, okay, what type of media and how can we um, mix and match different types of media, and by that I mean solid state, high performance disk drives, high capacity, lower cost disk drives, how do you mix those things together? And then the interplay between the storage layer 
both the delivery of block and embedding file systems into the interconnect layer and the processor layer uh, because that's what you need to do in order to have the applications run at, at higher levels of performance. Uh, so again, platforms, the evolution of platforms from storage only to really end-to-end. -end. So how do we better utilize processors? How do we better utilize interconnect? I mean, there are lots of technological advances uh, which are starting to happen, driven by by silicon vendors, uh, which give us the ability to layer software on top of and get far better efficiencies, looking at the end-to-end. -end. Uh, layering software on top, so we'll be talking about this uh, in some level of depth, IME, which is an application accelerator which is powered and enabled by solid state and non-volatile memory, WAS, uh, which is a software layer that provides the ability to collaborate, uh, distribute content and do live archive and then obviously file systems and then also looking at systems and how can we uh, design systems that are better suited at running the applications that you have to deal with day in day out far more efficiently than you have in the past. Um, HPC, as I, as I mentioned, really HPC is what continues to drive our uh, technology roadmap. Um, so uh, we look at HPC customers as a way uh, to really ensure that the products that we're developing and the investments that we're making in R&D are well aligned with scale. I mean, HPC continues to be very, very focused on scale uh, and cost-effective scale. So it's always a great mechanism for us to ensure that what we're developing will be suitable, will be applic applicable, and will be best of breed for our HPC users. And then that translates into uh, some of the other markets that we serve. Scalability in web cloud is an area where we've been investing very heavily. I mean, today DDN is the second largest provider of object-based technology behind Amazon. So we have more than 200 billion objects that are being managed uh, in a variety of customer locations. Some of the largest uh, web, cloud, and internet organizations in the world are using DDN as their backbone for object-based technology. So that has given us um, a really different view of uh, scale. I mean, scale in the world of HPC was really measured in read, write, bandwidth, and you know, processor capabilities. In the internet world, it's measured in uh, distributed environments where you're looking at a number of data centers. These data centers are interconnected together, and their job is to deliver content and process uh, consumer queries in as close to real time as possible at very, very large scale, taking into account um, not just um, optimal price performance and uh, time to resolving a query locally, but also distributed. So the problems that we've solved for these customers revolve around, well, you have hundreds of millions of consumers out there. These consumers are moving all over the world. So today I'm in Frankfurt. I will query my mobile device for something. The data that it needs to pull uh, needs to be in close proximity to Frankfurt. And on Thursday, I will get on a plane and go back to Los Angeles. Well, when I land in Los Angeles, my queries need to come from a data center that is close to Los Angeles. So so the issues of latency and the cost of payload moving from the data center through the internet to the consumer are problems that we've been solving or helping solve for these types of organizations. And then another area which has proven to be very, very effective for us uh, has to do with profiling and op optimizing applications which are being used by our customers. Uh, we've seen that in a variety of markets where HPC um, infrastructures are beneficial. So, for instance, financial services uh, is a sector where we have been very successful. 40% of the world's largest investment banks are DDN customers today. Uh, what they do with DDN technology is not really data center types of applications. What they do is um, they're using HPC type methodologies in order to accelerate time to insight and get a better view as to how 
how to invest and where to invest. So we're looking, for instance, at uh, portfolio risk management close to real time in very, very complex environments, uh, back testing where people will develop complex models and they need to know real time, same day, whether a model can be used to trade. So what we've given these customers, for instance, is the ability to shrink the amount of time that it takes to process a model by factor of 8, factor of 10. Uh, why is that important? It's not necessarily the factor of 8 or a factor of 10 that is important. The importance of it is being able to try a model and then trade the same day, not waiting for the next day for the data to become stale. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we've been able to accomplish by looking at the applications. Some are homegrown, uh, some are third party, and carefully profiling those applications in order to have the underlying infrastructure run very efficiently to deliver value to these organizations. I mean, same thing with manufacturing companies, you know, life science, genomics, pharmaceuticals, uh, oil and gas, which is really very, very close to, to HPC, uh, and then web cloud, which, which we discussed. So again, we're seeing an evolution of HPC use cases into a much broader set of markets, which, which I think is a, is a wonderful thing for the HPC community at large, because it means that what we've been doing in our world of HPC uh, is now gaining um, a, a lot more acceptance in a much, much, much broader world. And, and, and people in the broader world don't necessarily know how to deal with it, which has resulted in, in partnerships between academia, between the large HPC centers uh, in our market, and these organizations who are saying, hey, I know that I need to use HPC infrastructures, I just don't know how to do it. So help Help me figure it out. And, and we've seen that all over the world with academia centers really acting as sounding boards and trusted advisors to the enterprise for these types of things. Um, from a portfolio standpoint, uh, I mean, the evolution that we've seen in order to help solve these problems for HPC customers as well as for enterprise and HPC use cases is taking an end-to-end -end approach to the problem. So at one end, you have, you know, the compute, the server layer. Connected to that is our IME technology, which, again, um, leverages solid state and non-volatile memory uh, and accelerates applications utilizing that layer. Tied into that is a persistent storage layer, which is our SFA technology, tying into a live archive and uh, content distribution and collaboration, which is WAS, and then tying into uh, two other elements. One is tape libraries, um, the ability to move data in and out of tape libraries in order to process it uh, while cost optimizing. It is something that we've seen increasingly uh, in enterprise use cases. Uh, and then also tying into uh, public cloud. So we've developed S3, Swift, um, OpenStack interfaces into the public cloud, which give uh, our customers the ability to have their own private cloud, but also bridge into public clouds for the highest levels of efficiency and highest levels of cost efficiency. Um, product portfolio, so four pillars. Historically, DDN's focus was uh, in the middle two pillars. It was the platforms, the SFA platform, and the scalers, which is, you know, the file systems getting layered on top of it. Uh, those platforms have evolved, and, and we'll tell you about some of the new product announcements, which you, you will be able to see on our booth as well. is content distribution, its collaboration, and its live archive. Um, this is a development which we started seven years ago, has been in production for five years, uh, and is gaining adoption in HPC for collaboration and live archive applications. And the newest technology, which uh, is going GA at the end of this quarter, which is our IME um, technology, which we think will help revolutionize all of this by really leveraging and harnessing the power of SSD to accelerate applications. And we'll give you a lot more details uh, about this here. Uh, so the Wolf Creek platform, just, you know, I'll, I'll touch on it uh, very quickly. Uh, there's a lot more details that we'll walk you through. Basically, it's a very versatile platform, um, 60 gigabytes a second of bandwidth, 6 million IOPS, and it can be used in a variety of ways. It can be used um, 
as a platform uh, to tie into the IME software layer, so application acceleration populated with uh, solid state. So, so one Wolf Creek platform in an IME mode uh, can saturate at 60 gigabytes a second with solid state. You can also use it as an SFA platform, so you can layer the SFA OS on top of it. You can embed file systems into it. You can hang uh, disks behind it, so you can get north of six petabytes of capacity in one rack uh, using the SFA platform. And then internally, you can populate it with SSDs, different types of non-volatile uh, technologies, as well as spinning disks. So mix and match of different types of media, mix and ma match of different applications, just uh, a very high performance, very, very efficient platform that can do lots of different things. Um, IME, at a very high level, again, application acceleration. One of the use cases is a burst buffer, which is very applicable to uh, some of the HPC types of environments, where uh, we can take ill-behaved applications and applications where the file system is acting as a significant bottleneck, uh, and we can remove those bottlenecks and make the applications run much, much, much faster. I mean, here we're showing an example where uh, a a very poorly behaved application uh, because of the file system is slowing things down to 25 megabytes a second. We can take that back to what the platform can really deliver, which is a thousand times more. Uh, obviously, not all applications will be accelerated to that level, but IME is really a means to accelerate applications and remove the bottlenecks which um, have been kind of inserted into it because the applications weren't really developed with these types of scale um, elements in mind 10, 20, 30 years ago, and also because file systems, in, in many instances, uh, take applications and, and, and really slow them down. But we'll, we'll get to you in, 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 in a lot more detail about IME and what it does and the application profiling there. Uh, you know, this is one example which, you know, Dan, who is in the room, uh, attack. This is, uh, you know, S3D. Uh, these are the types of performance gains that, you know, we've seen in the real world. So this is, you know, factor of 9, factor of 20. Uh, what IME can do, uh, we are in the process of profiling a very broad range of applications uh, for a very broad set of customer use cases because at the end of the day, what we're looking uh, for IME to do is accelerate the basket of applications that are being used in a given in a given environment and in a given customer setting. Uh, and every customer is different, which is why it's a very systematic approach to taking the applications one by one, profiling them, optimizing them, and doing that optimization on the IME layer or uh, in those cases where customers have written the applications, there are very interesting things that can be done on both sides in order to streamline things. Um, WAS, which we talked about, and uh, I don't know how much detail we're going to get into with WAS, but again, think of it as uh, an object-based technology, real-time replication, high levels of security, can be distributed across lots of data centers in order to handle objects at very, very large scale. Uh, we have one, so giving you an idea of scale, we have one customer, for instance, uh, who is adding one billion objects a week into WAS, uh, distributed across two dozen data centers, and again, serving the needs of customers on mobile devices. So very large scale. I mean, one of the things I, um, uh, I've been saying for the past year or two is that I, I never thought I would see the day where the enterprise and non-HPC customers would achieve levels of scale that were comparable to what we've seen with the labs and academia. Well, well today we're seeing quite a few organizations who are doing things at far greater levels of scale than what is happening in HPC. And I think it's encouraging because it means that what has been happening in this industry is translating into benefits in many other industries. Um, so long term, you know, I thought I would talk very briefly about kind of the long term view. Uh, you know, one of the things uh, we uh, like to do and, uh, and our customers encourage us to do and, you know, would, would, would love to do it 
for anybody who, who has an interest in that, is really taking a long-term view at, you know, what does the future look like, you know, five years from now, seven years from now, what are the things, what are the trends that are happening which will impact things in a favorable way. Um, so these are just a few which I thought I would, you know, put on a slide and, and share with you. Uh, the first one is uh, we believe that the boundaries between different types of cynical or kind of blurring in together. It used to be that system architectures had a server layer, an interconnect layer, and then a storage layer. We think all of that is merging together, and what will happen is uh, organizations, in order to add value to what you're doing, will have to develop software technologies that take advantage of silicon. And that silicon, it really doesn't matter whether it's node local in the server, uh, whether that server has some SSD or different types of non-volatile memory technology into it or not. The boundaries between these you know, rigid hierarchies of server interconnect storage are really blurring together. So it's becoming a software model that leverages silicon and can be deployed uh, either as an appliance or can be deployed as software only. So, so that, that's one thing that, that we're seeing. Um, and, and that's why for the past four or five years, uh, more than 90% of our R&D investments have gone into the development of software that can be delivered as an appliance or as software only. Um, the second trend is <clears throat> We believe that intelligent tiering uh, is becoming increasingly important. And it's intelligent tiering not just in terms of, well, I have a non-volatile memory layer, and I have a spinning disk layer, and I have tape. Uh, we think it will become uh, far more complex and far more efficient by the same token as that, where you'll have different tiers of non-volatile memory, and there are lots of very interesting things that can be done taking advantage of those tiers. Uh, we believe that as the cost of solid state continues to drop, uh, what will happen is architectures will migrate into solid state based uh, for performance and low cost, high capacity based for live archive. And, and the layer in the middle, which today uh, is really most of what is going on in storage, will, will slowly dissipate into these two poles. Now, it won't happen overnight, uh, but this is something that uh, we think will start to happen slowly and intensify over the next four or five years or so. Um, IME and, and, and WAS technologies, we believe uh, that the application acceleration on the one hand and then object-based technology on the other hand initially will uh, coexist with file systems, um, you know, such as Lustre and GPFS and other ones. But over time, we believe that there will be a need for more efficient methodologies, more efficient ways of handling namespace types of challenges and, and tying that into non-volatile memory application acceleration on the one hand and then object based on the other. Uh, and file systems as we know them will evolve and will change. Uh, and again, that, that will happen over, uh, over a period of time. I mean, GPFS and Lustre will certainly continue to exist five years from now, uh, but uh, we believe that more interesting architectures will start to get deployed in customers' environments, and that we will be bringing some of those technologies to market in, in the years to come. Uh, and then finally, we think it's all about workflows and applications. It's not about the uh, underlying IT infrastructure anymore. That's a lesson that we learned uh, with our web, cloud, internet uh, customers, and it's a lesson that we learned in, in the enterprise, that you can impact workflows and you can gain much more efficiency by focusing on the application and the customer's workflow, whether centralized or in a distributed environment, than by trying to squeeze every little bit out of a processor or a spinning disk. Of course, you have to do those things, uh, but there are so much more efficiencies that can be gained by analyzing a customer's environment and developing an IT infrastructure that is aimed at accelerating the application, distributing the content, accelerating time to insight, and then delivering the content into, uh, into the constituents, wherever they might be and whoever they might be. 
Um, so these are just, you know, some long-term views. These are the places where we are investing R&D dollars uh, because at the end of the day, if we do not accelerate the applications, if we do not deliver content faster and more cost-effectively, and if we do not leverage uh, these advances in silicon technology which are happening right now, um, I mean, the old paradigms uh, will break uh, and are already starting to break. And so that's, uh, that's how we see things and that's the product portfolio.